Hi, uh, with me today in the break room, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Matt Taibbi, arguably friend of show. <laughs> friend of show. Matt has uh, written a piece, it is entitled The Great American Bubble Machine. It is basically a story uh, about uh, Goldman Sachs. And uh, I, viewers of the break room live know that I've been saying for a long time without a lot to, to substantiate it that one of the big players in this entire debacle has been Goldman Sachs. You actually um, uh, do a little bit, bring it, provide a little more depth. But let's go through this because you really argue that Goldman Sachs is at the epicenter of the creation, at least in, in modern times, of these massive bubbles and are sort of making money on both ends of it. You talk about three different bubbles, the tech, the, the housing, and gas and commodities. Let's start with, well, let's just start with who a lot of the big players in our government right now uh, that people may be aware of that are basically of the brotherhood of Goldman Sachs? Well, right now, probably the two main figures from Goldman Sachs who are in the government uh, would be Mark Patterson, who is the number two guy at the Treasury, uh, who uh, just a year ago was a Goldman Sachs lobbyist. Uh, if you might remember Obama on the campaign trail last year promising that he would never have a registered lobbyist in the White House, well, this about a month into his presidency, he made this guy the number two guy in the Treasury. And a year ago, he was lobbying uh, to prevent pay restrictions on uh, employees on Wall Street. The other guy is Gary Gensler, who was an aide to Bob Rubin under the Clinton administration. He's a uh, former Goldman banker, and he's now head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates derivatives like credit default swaps and, uh, and the oil commodities market. Um, so he's an immensely powerful person who uh, 10 years ago was a key figure in deregulating this very market. And uh, so when they put him in charge of this whole business, uh, it really horrified a lot of people who are close observers. And of course, Paulson, uh, Hank Paulson, uh, right. our Hank. former Treasury Secretary, and Bob Rubin. Bob Rubin, uh, yeah, Joshua Bolton, who was Bush's Chief of Staff. Uh, you have the heads of the New York Stock Exchange, the Canadian World Bank, the New York Fed, uh, the Italian World Bank. I mean, the list of former Goldman employees who occupy really important positions, not only in our government, but in you know, the sort of international financial infrastructure is just, it's mind boggling. Do these guys ever have like a reunion where they all go to like the Waldorf Astoria? <laughs> like a and, like, cave come on, somewhere, right? Come on. Yeah, it's called Davos, actually. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. it's really, it's, it's it, well, you know, a lot, a substantial percentage of the influential financial players in the world are, you know, uh, graduates of the Goldman Sachs School. All right, so let's go through this as you talk about how uh, leading up through the 80s and the 70s uh, into the 90s, Goldman Sachs had this uh, saying, uh, long-term greed. Right. What, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, Goldman had a reputation of being kind of a buttoned-up conservative bank um, that wouldn't uh, chase short-term profits and would reject business if they thought that it wouldn't make everybody money in the long term. And uh, that means their clients, that means if they underwrote things that the, they thought it was actually going to be a good deal, uh, you know, they wouldn't chase, you know, the you know, profits six months or eight months ahead of time. They would, they would be looking for things that would make money over the long term. In fact, one of my uh, very good friends from Russia back in the day was a Goldman Sachs banker, and he used to tell me stories about how Goldman used to turn down business uh, when they thought that, you know, it was shady or they thought it wouldn't pan out in the future. But they clearly changed their MO sometime in the mid-90s, and that's when the tech bubble started. Before we, we actually start talking about the tech bubble, what do you think were the forces that made it change? I mean, so they had this theory that, like, look, we're not going to leave the ground uh, fallow, essentially. Right. Uh, we're going to do things only that have long-term prosperity right. and uh, maintain the integrity of the system. Right. What changed in the early 90s? Well, uh, it didn't change specifically at Goldman Sachs so much, but there was a cultural change on Wall Street that had to do with a lot of the investment banks uh, going public. Uh, you know, before the, the early 90s or the late 80s, uh, investment banks were inherently conservative because they were betting with their own partners' money. Uh, but when they went public, suddenly they weren't playing with their own money anymore. They could chase after short-term, gigantic bonuses, but it would be somebody else's money they were playing with. Now, Goldman didn't go public until uh, the year 2000 or 2001, but that culture had already started to infect Wall Street by then, and that's that culture of uh, basing your uh, in-house strategy on how, uh, how large a bonus you could get in the short term, I think it started to infect all the houses, including Goldman. Y you want these people on some level to be greedy. 
because they know that you want them to want to make money for their clients. But I think what happened was is that uh, you know Wall Street traditionally had at least a minimal level of societal concern and ethics, and that just disappeared in the in the mid '90s, uh, and it, it, by now it's completely gone. <laughs>